Hi everyone, I'm Todd Keats from One Day One Week, and today I'm very excited. We're here with Joy Javits, who graciously has accepted my invitation to participate and can't wait to talk with her and have her talk with us, everybody listening, uh, just about her, her incredible background uh, in the theater arts. And one of the things I wanted to mention up front is uh, just that she is a graduate of Brown University and I'll say a proud graduate of Brown University. I see that smile, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the theater arts program there. And I have to say that there's a pun that I have to use. So the Brown University and her program there, she set sail to bring, no pun intended, joy to the world. <laughs> <laughs> I <It's> couldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> so Joy is originally from New York City. And after Brown University, she headed down to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill uh, to become the company choreographer for Playmakers Repertory Company and taught movement to MFA students and dance and drama to undergraduates. And then about 30 years ago, she founded a, an organization called The Public Eye. And so for the past 30 years, she's been giving people the tools to make eloquent presentations. And eloquent can range a full gamut. They can be vivid and forceful and fluid and graceful and very importantly, persuasive. About two years later, she created an organization which is actually how we ended up coming together uh, more recently, but the result of her work, uh, an organization at UNC Healthcare uh, called Door to Door, and it brings professional performers, so literary, uh, visual artists, and so forth, that go to visit hospital patients uh, in their rooms and providing you know, moments that help make their day. And uh, it, it, it's very touching to me, and I know it's meant so much to Joy. And I'm, I'm gonna ask her some questions and she's gonna share some of her experiences and we'll tie it in throughout to the importance of caregiving and patient advocacy and what it means to not just the patients, but also the people that are caring for them. So Joy, I'd love to, I'd love to have you share with us how your early life you know, shaped your spirit of giving back and especially through the healing arts. So if you could share a little bit about that, that'd be great. I did go to four amazing schools, and I think those all were huge in, in the shaping of my thinking and my spirit and my life, and not to mention my name, which had a lot to do with everything also given me by my parents. I went to the Riverside Church Nursery School how crazy is that? And my papa, the senator, took my hand and walked me up there because we lived in Washington Heights. Uh, then I went to the Ethical Culture Society School and learned about ethics from kindergarten through sixth grade. We had no homework and we really talked about everything and cheating and lying and how to introduce yourself and how to have pride. And then seventh through uh, 12th grade, I went to a school called Dalton, which is in and out of the news for various reasons. But what was amazing was from no homework at Ethical Culture, we had a monthly assignment of, in all of our classes and it was completely up to us when and how we did them. So once again, trust, honesty. And then I went to Brown, which, in my sophomore year, Ira Magaziner and Elliot Maxwell turned the school around. And it, is, it has remained that way with, you know, people making their own majors, deciding what and how they were going to offer the world their thinking and studies and research. And it remained that way. It was called the new curriculum. And so those, those four, and then my parents were also amazing. My mother was a bit of a social worker. She, she was on boards and she helped 
with all kind Meals on Wheels and and such organizations. And then my father, not to mention my father, who was just amazing. He was really beloved in the Senate for his honesty, his forthrightness, his uh, uh, attention to the law and what was right and social justice. Yeah, thanks for sharing all that. It really helps helps us understand the influences you had, which sound wonderful. Oh my gosh, such a wide array of such positive influences that you had in so many different levels. Uh, and I can understand more now how that led you to what you ended up embarking on in your life. I, I'd love for you to you know, briefly share some of your experiences as a choreographer and a dancer. You know, Tell me a little bit about that, some of the memorable performances that you're choreographed and danced. Let's just start with that. Well, I did have, again, crazy, extraordinary teachers. I grew up in Manhattan. A very famous woman is named Hanya Holm. Another famous person is Anita Zahn, who was a student of Isadora Duncan's sister. <laughs> I was at Carnegie Hall studying ballet with a Russian who tapped my foot when it wasn't pointed hard enough. And then Merce Cunningham and Alvin Ailey. I danced with all of these people. It was uh, unbelievable. And then uh, I, I did uh, choreograph at college. Uh, the first dance I remember making was, was a delight called Halt, Head, arms, legs, and torso. And there were four of us, and we used the music of Stravinsky, which I pieced together from uh, one of his uh, pieces. And uh, we each, the, the, the Billy Sigenfeld danced the uh, torso, which he was magical at doing. The man is still a dancer, would never have been a dancer probably, except for my invitation. Patch Simon is a, actually works in an interesting way at Equity um, Union. And I have spoken with her about the idea of artists and dancers being caregivers. Uh, she was legs, of course. And then, um, you know, there was a, a two others. Ruby Shang did her beautiful arms. She became a dancer choreographer as well and uh, was with Paul Taylor's company for years and had her own company. So. It was just amazing. I think I was head because I can do that. Oh, <laughs> I can't do that. It doesn't work. No. <laughs> well, you learn that at Brown or where did you learn that? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then I, I was so lucky. I went to the Tyrone Guthrie Theater as an apprentice uh, right out of college. And the... Uh, I got to choreograph their Christmas show, and I was uh, uh, one of the smaller characters in some Shakespearean plays, so the movement was important, how one carried oneself in the costume. And, and, and for two years right after that, I worked for Patricia Birch, who was the choreographer of Greece, uh, the Me Nobody Knows, Pacific Overtures, A Little Night Music. She had four shows simultaneously on Broadway when I worked for her. Mm -hmm. And um, I was there when Stephen Sondheim and Hal Prince put together A Little Night Music. Okay. And then I, I, I worked with the Ra uh, Raleigh Little Theater when I moved here to Chapel Hill. And I must have done 20 shows for them. Uh, Joseph and the Technicolor Dream Code, Archie and the Hittable, which is about a cockroach and an alley cat. I think Eartha Kitt originated that, that part, Mahitabel the cat. And uh, we had a divine woman named Yolanda Raven, gorgeous singer. Uh, so like that. And then, and then I did get to choreograph at Playmakers. I was company choreographer for six years and did, did everything they, they had, usually a, a couple of musicals a year. One last thing was that I danced with several companies, modern dancer uh, companies, and uh, for 20 years I danced with Diane Elber, uh, whose sister was with Martha Graham and 
Carol Richard, whom we lost, but oh my God, we adored her. And, and the music and the dances, those two women choreographed were extraordinary. Sometimes we were on the main stage at, the, at Duke and UNC, the two universities here. And sometimes we were in art galleries or outside site specific. Incredible, incredible experiences for sure. And just even more so now helping me and, and whoever's watching understand how this shapes your life. And they're such powerful experiences. So yeah. that actually brings me to healing through the arts. So I'd love to know your, your high level view of why that's important healing through the arts. But my belief is that arts are, they, they are not only healing, they're nourishing, they're encouraging, they bring joy, they make you laugh and smile a beautiful song, they make you cry with pleasure and or sorrow for the story in the tale. Uh, in a dance or such. So physiologically, there are two chemicals. One that is a positive one when you're smiling and happy and feeling good, right? And then a negative one, the cortisol maybe, that's the negative one when you're worried or scared or alone or hurting, especially if you're hurting. So that changing, you know, offering the good chemicals by offering a song, a dance, uh, an instrumental sound, uh, reading a poem, uh, helping somebody make a picture or showing them big photographs of Paris as John Rosenthal did and Melody Egan danced with a young, child, the almost the age of the patient and the little patient would help with the, moving the scarves around that she would run under. Mm -hmm. And so the involvement of the patient uh, into the arts, which are often nonverbal, you don't have to learn things to do them, especially you can just be there, listen or participate and you have your own thoughts. I just think the arts are a beautiful, beautiful aspect of healing and only a part, the doctors and the nurses, oh my goodness, you know, so much more to healing, but the attitude and bringing up the good spirit and the hope, I think is a huge part of healing as well. I, I agree with you completely. And that's actually, a wonderful segue to our next topic, which is door to door. And so I, I, I think we already have some inkling as to what led you to founding it, but if you could share a little bit about what did lead you to that and the early days and evolution of it, that'd be great. Because it really is in its uh, many decades now. <laughs> I worked before door to door at Duke Hospital. And I got that job to be the program director for an arts program called Cultural Services that was going on in Duke Hospital, even four years before that. So actually I'm into the 30 years range. Uh, and that job got to me on a total fluke because being squeamish, I would never have thought of such a thing. But at the end of a, a time here in Chapel Hill, when I was in the American Dance Festival with Ruby Shang and we did a dance for 150 people and I danced and I assisted, I didn't want to go home to New York. And I picked up the phone and I called the North Carolina Arts Council and I didn't get a menu or an operator. I got a woman named Gail Fry. I'll never forget her name. She said, oh, you want to stay here and you're a dancer, a theater person? Hmm. She said, I just had lunch with Janice Palmer. And she started about a few years ago, she started an arts program at Duke Hospital for patients and staff. Uh, and it was called Cultural Services. And 
uh, she's looking for a program director and she has exactly one other person on her staff. So you would make three. <laughs> and I called her up and got the job. I started four or five programs, which if you wish, I'll tell you a little about because they were amazing. But one of them was called Room Service. And we then named, when I went to UNC, we named the program Door to Door from the Room Service idea. And that was the one where I brought performing artists to the patients in their rooms. And mm -hmm. uh, her idea, she said, in Los Angeles, at one of the hospitals in LA, there was a program called Strolling Musicians. And they mostly were probably in the lobbies and the hallways, not so much in patient rooms. But she said sometimes they ventured if the doctor said maybe. So I took that idea and went mostly to patient rooms because uh, the people in the hallways tended to be sometimes caregivers and sometimes nurses and doctors taking a break and sometimes patients who were going home soon. But the patients who were really sick, they were in their rooms, usually with caregivers and family and friends. And so that was the place to go. And, and I, I do, do uh, switched around and I needed to make a change. And I went to UNC and looked around and happened to find a place where a woman said, uh, we are starting, we wanna start a program of humanities and arts. We've had a couple of meetings. We have $1,500 for you for the year. Would you like to take the job? And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> So that was the beginning of Door to Door in around 1991 or 93. Because it was such a tiny bit of money and I did want to make a little bit, I started writing grants immediately. And the uh, medical foundation helped me a little bit, the fundraising arm. Uh, and uh, I was paid a salary, a, a small salary by um, um, well, Janice Palmer, when I did Duke, so I thought there's got to be a way for UNC as well. But uh, that happened later, the salary, which did come to be. But for about uh, 15 of those 30 years, I'd say I wrote grants and I would take a little tiny bit of money and I would pay my artists and I would find as many volunteers as I could. That's a perfect segue to Tell me more about the types of artists, the, you know, the types of performers and performances um, and a bit about them. And then also if there were some that were just that you remember that were just so out of the box. I did once have a saxophone player. <laughs> I thought, are you crazy? <laughs> that's, that's a little loud. But in fact, it was gorgeous. I had acoustic bass player. In fact, Ben, uh, Janice's son came and hauled his gigantic acoustic bass around and played for people. Hammer Dulcimer, a, a beautiful woman who had also studied how to be with people who are dying and uh, had a a degree in that and she played her beautiful hammer dulcimer we had many guitar playing singers many classical jazz uh, not so much rock and roll but you know maybe 50s 60s tunes uh peter kramer came and he we called him jukebox he knew every song you could name and he would bring singers with him so he could do harmony and he played the guitar and sometimes they would too. And violinists uh, from medical students who were gorgeous players having done Suzuki from three years old uh, to uh, gypsy, kind of a gypsy sound of, of Gabriel Pelly who plays with old ceremonies and has his own CDs. Many of my players have their own CDs. Charles Petty came, he came for two years and I, I didn't pay him anything. And uh, he uh, played his mandolin and sang songs from the mountains of North Carolina. And 55 people of the UNC uh, choir came to sing every, every Christmas of a week or two before. And we would, we would stroll them 
around the children's floors. There were three children's floors and we'd walk up the stairs and walk as if we were outside serenading. All of that and, and more. There's a, a man who plays the Cora. It's a West African gourd with fishing line up, up a, uh, along all wood and sounds like a harp, Will Ridenour. And, um, and then some famous ones. I had a couple of famous ones. Now this is all music. I haven't really mentioned the poets yet or the visual artists of which there were a uh, beautiful a caricature artist. Th this was the most lovely thing. She'd walk into a room and somebody would look like what you can imagine, heck on wheels in the bed, right? The hair and the no makeup. Sometimes they'd try to do makeup. And she would draw them taking out all the whatever was, you know, uh, tubes and things, make their hair gorgeous, give them back hair if they had been in chemo and didn't have any hair. What was your hair like? And she would ask them, what do you love doing? And they would say, I want to be a singer. She draw them as a singer. And their face was amazingly like them. And then the body she played with. So the drawings, they were fabulous. And she, the, the patient would put that picture up on the wall. And when the doctors came back, that wasn't room 62. That was the singer who had three children and a dog, which he could see in the picture. And they became people. So it's, that was really fabulous. And I had photographers and painters who would bring their work and we'd do a little mini art show and poets who would read a poem and give them a poem or help them write a poem if they wished. I used to do a little calligraphy. I, I can draw nicely uh, the writing and I would get them to dictate a card of thanks or a birthday card and I would calligraphy it for them. Oh, wonderful. And you mentioned, you had mentioned a couple of other famous people. Uh, Josh Lozoff is an amazing magician who was invited to Japan to the uh, games, the Olympic games. And I did this, uh, this, this, this fellow is, is famous among us. It, it's George Winston. I don't know if you know that name, but he played, he would go to hospitals wherever he was doing his piano concerts of new music, really. And he would play the guitar. He wouldn't play the piano for the patients, but he would come for about 40 minutes. And he came several times uh, to, to do that. And that was just, you know, that was special because many people do, do know his, his beautiful music. Yes, yeah. in fact, I have some CDs of his. Ah, so, so nice. He was beautiful. very friendly and beautiful. It, it's healing too, because it's so melodic and gentle, most of it, and emotional. So, so I think, yeah, yeah. that's as famous as we got. <laughs> well, pretty famous though, that's wonderful. Oh, one more, Jonathan Bird, who wrote this beautiful story I might, I might read. Um, He's a writer, but he also won the a famous, I don't know who gave the award, but Lyle Lovett had won the year before for the best uh, songwriter in America. And he won, Jonathan Bird won one year for the best. And he, all of his uh, CDs are original music. So what would you say, you've touched on it already, but if we focus on the impact that the program has had overall, so, and that's in different ways. It could be for the individuals and their families, it could, and for, it could be for the people in the healthcare facilities, the doctors, the nurses, and the community overall, and then especially for caregivers and the people who are with the patients. So if you can touch on some of those, I'd really be interested. I've had occasionally a message from a doctor who Stephen Mall is his name and is, is one. And he came down every time Billy Stewart was playing his uh, jazz and original guitar music in the lobby, he would come down to listen as often as he could and invited us also to uh, go when he did rounds and just start 
just play a little music as they started to go visit patients or at the end of it. There was another doctor who was a painter and I gave him a show on the stage. There's a bit of a stage in one of the hospitals, children's hospital. And he brought in 10 of his paintings and we put them up and I stayed with them all day and he stayed with them some and people would come and say, wow. And, and they were medical drawings of paintings of him with a baby delivering a baby or um, so. Mm -hmm. So art shows on the, in, in there, as well as to the rooms. It gave people a lift. I, nurses, one of my favorite evaluations says, sweet, 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 you know? And then mostly people would say, thank you for coming. You made my day. Or they'd say, I feel inspired. I, I'd have um, a, a little evaluation that had before and after and people would go one to 10 and they'd put their X and they could write also. And it was from a feeling poor to great. And they would circle the great after and they would say depressed before or sad before or one or so. So we know, and parents of children would be so happy. You know, one of the things I taught my artists was do not walk into the room and say, how are you? because that will always elicit either a lie, I'm fine, or a story, which everybody else is asking them. So we didn't. I said, you walk in the room and you say, hi, where are you from? Or do you play a, an instrument? Or what's your favorite song? Or, you know, do, do you know a poem? Have, do, have you memorized? adults and children. And I went about, I'd say I went 60% adults and 40% children because children had a lot more opportunity and um, recreation therapists were fabulous with them and nurses and all. But so I went mostly to the adults who really had a television period. So when I went in there with a Cora and the player and the violinist and they sit, sat down and said, they're gonna play for five or 10 minutes, was that okay? People would go, what? And then they go, yeah, <laughs> mostly. And if they said no, even then it was okay because they had the power to tell, they couldn't tell a nurse not to come in, but they could tell us go away. So even that was good. What would you say in your experience with patients, how frequently were caregivers involved, whether that was family or uh, people that were hired to care for these patients? So my programs both were in hospitals. Now we're also in, uh, I think, three or four hospitals, and one of them is a psychiatric hospital, but they're all hospitals. So nurses and doctors are total caregivers, and they were always there and involved. And, and the delicacy of, you know, oh, we'll wait, you know, we'll wait mostly, but sometimes they'll say, finish the song, we'll wait which was lovely. In children's rooms, there were always a, a parent, almost always, it was rare that a child was without a parent or two parents or brothers and sisters and parents. There might be six people in the room if it wasn't pre-COVID. There's a beautiful movie, The Acoustics of Care, that is on my website, which is door-to-door, -door, uh, NC for North Carolina.com. And in that movie, you can see this elder couple and it was an anniversary or something. And uh, again, Billy, Billy was playing and they started holding hands. Mm -hmm. You know, people move closer to each other because the nonverbal part of the arts is just magical. I always tell my artists too, you feel out what is needed in here. Do they need something lively, even though they look sad or do they need something sad even though they look lively or the opposite what do you what do you what's your intuition and artists are amazingly intuitive so they would often guess right or people would say that was my favorite song or you know that was our song or 
something or they'd sing along often. Mm. Um, so I think it was every bit, we, we call it a, a care for the caregivers. It's, you know, it's, it was half for them and half for the patients. That is so important, care for the caregiver. That's a topic that I've talked to about with previous guests and will be a recurring theme throughout the podcast series. And also I've written about it and will continue to write about it because it's very important. And it's often the caregivers forget to care for themselves. So they're so focused on taking care of a loved one or whoever they've been trusted with that they're, they don't. I can be guilty of that as well, where I yeah. just, I'm just so focused and somebody will say, make sure you're taking care of yourself. And I'll say, yeah, 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 I will. I will. Don't worry. And before you know it, months go by. Yeah, it, it's, it's yeah. a very important thing. Do you know, are, in the bigger picture, are there similar programs like this around the country? Absolutely. When I started, which was 1988, this woman, Janice Palmer, over at Duke, so this is pre-UNC, they didn't have a program then, they, she invited eight people from around the country. One came from California, Michigan, Florida, uh, and two, three others. Most of them, three or uh, four of the eight were the wives of the president or CEO of the hospital who played the piano occasionally, or they had cards available at Valentine's Day or Mother's Day. The other three, there were three others besides Duke that had extensive programs. That was way back then. Now, there's something that used to be called the Society for the Arts and Healthcare, and now it's called Arts, um, I did write it down. I'll try to, I'll try to find it. If you look up Society for the Arts and Healthcare, however, it'll come up because it was that's such a beautiful name. They named it Art, Arts Healing now or something, but they have a program in a beautiful city every year. And I think somewhere between 500 and a thousand people come to that. And mostly they are a mix of artists and doctors. And then there are also programs now, you know, uh, a canvas company that makes uh, art that lights up or mosaic company that makes a light box that goes in the ceiling or on the floor. Or I've seen fish in the children's area where they step on the fish and the fish squirm around. They're magical things. Okay. The North Carolina arts not council, but it was arts in healthcare. And I think that went away. You know, I'm really not sure about that, but maybe other states have such a thing. But the Society for the Arts and Healthcare would know every place there is or isn't one. They're located in Washington, DC. That's actually really important to know. And people who are listening, whether they be caregivers, patients, families, doctors, nurses, administrators can understand that. And now that you've shared with them where they can go to try and find a program like this, if what they've heard today inspires them and says, wow, I, I've, got to, I've got to do this. I, I've got to look at this for my hospital here. And that's just wonderful. In fact, I'll probably bring it up to some administrators. It's called the Arts and Health Alliance. One could start a program like this with one artist, one musician, if you wish, a little bit of funding from your arts council, which either that or maybe the uh, volunteer association, which is the magic for me at UNC, the volunteer, UNC volunteer association, and, and a little bit of funding because usually this person cannot, you know, you can volunteer some if you're retired, but you know, so they even then they might find a retired person who would like to play music the way Roy taught these harmonica players mm -hmm. and just not even have money. You know, no, no, he needs to know to wash. And there was a training that everybody takes about 
um, the, to be careful when you go to patient rooms. But I'm in a hospital, you know, this could easily be for people in their homes. An artist once a week could go for one hour and give them a little piano lesson or the harmonica, you know, or a guitar or, or read them poetry or help them start writing. Writing is so good for the brain and the heart and the, you know, what is your journey? Put it down on paper. Oh, I'm hurting. Oh, that it makes me think of this. Well, when I was a child, this, you know, things come from writing that so just a pencil and paper and somebody to start you with an idea. So really doable for everybody, especially those who are can't get out. And now Zoom, holy moly, we <laughs> can totally do this with anybody that has a computer. I've just been thinking about it as you've been talking. And you're there's everybody we know, we believe can benefit from the arts, whether they can verbalize it and realize it, we know how it heals. And that could be an healing, meaning just how it can promote better health, it can promote better relationships between people. I mean, you think about it, and I love your perspective on this. And you think about, so you're talking about the door-to-door -door program, which is wonderful and artists going into the rooms of patients or strolling down the halls or what have you and how it helps the staff and how it helps the patients and so forth. Think about how that also brings people together because that is another level of healing. It's, it's community-based and I'd love your thoughts on that. You know, um, this beautiful man, Jonathan Bird, whose, whose uh, article I, I was thinking, you know, to read you, he mentions in there that every time he plays now at a bar, he looks out in the audience and knows that there's possibly a mother who is grieving or worried for a child that may be an adult child or a little child that, it, that is ill. And so he doesn't look at even the bar audience the same way he used to, which is everybody there's, you know, having a good time and noisy and a little talking. And, and, and so he, he feels it and sees it differently. So it changed life for him. Another one of my musicians said, I wasn't a musician until I started doing this work. Now I feel like a musician. So they're both saying there's some spirit that's, other and and so audiences i think feel that they they all love whoever's on the stage so they're there and they and they and they're there for hours often and they react and they emote and they cry or scream or laugh or applaud and, and i think the arts are so good for telling truth and reinterpreting in a different perspective and out of the box, like you say, you, you have a different experience if there's somebody facilitating using artistic ideas. So yes, yes, I think art is huge potential healer of the planet if we, we'd allow it. If you would, before we go, I would love for you to read that. Uh, oh, lovely. I have to uh, bring, it, bring it up here. It's fine. So it's called The Toughest Gig. This is by Jonathan Bird, door-to-door -door performer, he said. She was beautiful, even though treatment had robbed her of her hair. It was obvious from her delicate cheekbones, olive skin and perfect teeth that she had been a very pretty young woman. Her closed eyes were frozen in the grimace of slow lasting pain. She was also disconnected from oxygen, IVs and monitors, literally her last connections to this world. I wondered what kind of tough decisions her mother had made in the previous days. Emotionally unready to sing, I decided to play a melody, Home Sweet Home. 
a simple tune from the nine, from the 1800s with a fitting title for the final journey. We were forbidden to get close to very ill patients, but I got as close as I could without touching her and began to play slowly, unsure whether she could even hear me. The young woman curled up into a fetal position and began to rock back and forth. She could hear me. Everything that I had ever thought was important to me faded from existence. For the first time in my life, I knew what it felt like to be a shaman, a priest, a messenger of God, summoning up all the joy, beauty, and humanity that I could manage and bringing it to people who needed it more than anyone else in the world. I was smiling and crying at the same time. No higher honor could be bestowed on any musician. No tougher gig ever existed. On a beautiful spring morning, I left that room carrying a lesson in the power of music. Now, even when I'm playing to a crowded bar or a coffee house, I try to remember that I have no idea what someone in the room is going through. Perhaps a mother is there just back from sitting in the hospital with her beautiful dying daughter. Music can be great fun for a night out on the town, but it can also be like water for a lost soul wandering in a desert of heartache. About once a month, I return to the hospital to visit patients and share the gift of music. I'll never forget the last musical rites of that beautiful young woman. <laughs> and one of the greatest rewards of, of my career. <laughs> it's such a, a beautiful piece, isn't it? <laughs> It's incredibly beautiful. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a beautiful writer of all his music, and he writes uh, as well. And thank yeah. you for sharing that. Oh my gosh, yeah. Got, tried to hold off, but <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> a few tears. <laughs> it was beautiful, and you you shared that beautifully. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Such a, a an honor to talk about this work that I did for so many years. And oh thank gosh! You. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm um, <laughs> I'm so, I'm thrilled. I mean, I I've enjoyed getting to know you and just the conversations and your energy is is infectious and <laughs> and it's real. And I just so appreciate that. And I think anybody who's watching this will feel the same. And well, you keep giving back and giving back and giving back. And that's a beautiful thing in my book. So thank you. Well, yes. You as well. Oh my goodness, what you what you do for your your parents. And this is such a beautiful idea to, to share. Thank you. I I look forward to just getting it out there more and more. And hopefully I always look at things. I've had people, great influences in my life. And if this touches one person and helps one person move it and pay it forward and helps them, uh, it just, it'll mean, it means the world to me. It's just incredible because it's just about, to me, I'm a big believer in paying things forward. Yeah. That's a beautiful phrase, just beautiful. Yeah. Well, Joy, thank you again. And Pleasure. I will be in touch. We will be talking very soon. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Take care. You too.
primary purpose of the podcast is to educate. While guests are invited to listen, listeners acknowledge that they are not being provided professional advice from the podcast or any guests. One Day One Week and its sponsor, 17 Commerce LLC, expressly disclaim any and all liability or responsibility for any direct, indirect, incidental, special, consequential, or other damages arising out of any individual's use of, reference to, reliance on, or inability to use the podcast episodes or the information presented in the episodes. Music